I always loved RV camping with my family. It was a tradition that we started when I was a kid, and we continued it every summer. We had an old RV that we used to travel around the country, exploring new places and enjoying nature. It was our home away from home, and we had many happy memories in it. This year, we decided to go to a secluded campground in the mountains, where we could relax and disconnect from the world. It was me, my wife, and our two kids, a boy and a girl, aged 10 and 8. We packed our bags, loaded the RV, and hit the road. The drive was long, but scenic. We passed by green fields, rolling hills, and sparkling lakes. We sang songs, played games, and told stories. We were having a great time until we reached the last stretch of the road. It was a narrow, winding path that led us deeper into the woods. The trees were tall and dense, blocking the sunlight in the view. The road was bumpy and uneven, making the RV shake and rattle. We felt like we were entering a different world, a darker and more mysterious one. We finally arrived at the campground, which was nothing more than a clearing in the forest, with a few wooden signs and a fire pit. There was no one else there, which we thought was strange, since it was peak season. We shrugged it off, thinking that maybe we were lucky to have the place to ourselves. We parked the RV, hooked it up to the power and water supply, and set up our camp. We pitched a tent, unfolded some chairs, and lit a fire. We roasted marshmallows, sang songs, and told stories. We were having a great time until the sun went down. That's when we started to hear them. At first, they were faint and distant, like whispers in the wind. We couldn't make out what they were saying, but they sounded like human voices. We thought they were other campers, maybe in another clearing nearby. We ignored them, thinking that they would quiet down soon, but they didn't. They got louder and closer, like they were coming towards us. We could hear them more clearly, and we realized that they were not speaking any language we recognized. They were chanting, in a rhythmic and sinister way. They sounded like they were in a trance, or a frenzy. We got scared, and we decided to go inside the RV. We locked the doors, closed the windows, and turned on the lights. We hoped that they would leave us alone, or that they would pass by us. We hoped that they were harmless, or that they were just playing a prank. But they weren't. They surrounded us. We could see them through the curtains, moving in the shadows. They were wearing dark robes, hoods, and masks. They carried torches, knives, and symbols. They looked like a cult, or a sect. They looked like they were up to no good. They circled the RV, chanting louder and louder. They banged on the walls, scratched the windows, and rocked the vehicle. They tried to break in to get to us. They wanted us for some reason. They wanted to hurt us, or worse. We panicked, but we decided to stay silent. After about an hour, they went silent. I slowly opened door and no one is outside. I turned my head towards my family and asked them, WTF just happened? I am in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We are high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We traveled to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry in mainland. We hiked to the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room and an infirmary, twelve huts each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. 
Tom, Jack, and I got in Hut 7 along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to Hut 21. All four corner huts, 1, 12, 13, 24 were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in 30 minutes where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning and so we have to wake up by 4.30 a.m. as the sunrise is at 5.45 a.m. It is a half hour hike and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5.15 a.m. and were told it was about 10 minutes away but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling, but they were tense. What do you think that sound was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was and I don't want to know. Susan replied, only that it should stay away from us. Emily said, come on, Peter. Don't scare the girls. Tom laughed. Yeah, it can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier. Ashwin said with conviction. I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out. Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small LCD screen wasn't so easy to look at, but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie, all right. It must be some lens flare thingy, I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, guys where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here. Ashwin said, I haven't seen them after we came back to camp. Tom responded in a worried manner, come Susan, let's check the hut out. Emily grabbed on Susan's hand and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere, as if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone-chilling growl and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I had never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously canceled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing. Emily said still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and felt threatened when we came here. Susan said, stop trying to justify murder. I shouted, I know she was just trying to help, trying to make sense of it all. But I was scared shitless. I am sorry, I am just scared. I apologize. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay, I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, given the circumstances. We will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon and they will escort us out of here. Till then, stay here and stay quiet. 
please don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back we were told it was a bear which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself, no more summer camps, but I still have nightmares and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is night time and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I had heard this story when I was back in college. I don't remember where it came from. But it's always stuck with me due to the horrific descriptions of what this park ranger saw. I'm not really sure about the names or dates for this one. However, I can tell you that it happened at least 15 years ago. Possibly longer though. The older I get, the memory becomes less clear. A man, forgive me if his name escapes me, who had been a ranger for several years at this point had talked about reporting seeing something absolutely bone-chilling while driving along late at night. It was dark outside, obviously, and there were no lights to illuminate the area in which he saw something he could not explain. He also mentioned not seeing proper moonlight, thus giving him little chance to see what it was he had witnessed. He, however, saw enough to be able to tell the others about what was out there in the darkness. It wasn't until recently that this man told anyone of his sighting. He did not want people to say he was crazy, or even lying. But at some point following the incident, one of his fellow rangers told him that the other rangers had reported seeing something similar while working in nearby areas along the road. None of them knew what they were looking at. But they all agreed it could not have been an animal known to inhabit these regions, bear, deer, etc. The descriptions given by each ranger even matched the description given by the first ranger, the only difference being which area they had seen the thing. What they claimed to have seen was a tall, dark figure that stood on two legs, having no discernible neck. The head sat directly upon the shoulders, no visible ears or hair above its brow, and a long arm hung down just below its knees while the other one reached to its upper chest. Ursula described, the main ranger said it looked like something out of a horror movie. It made him so scared that he nearly lost consciousness just from seeing it standing there, not 25 feet away from him. That's just how frightening this sighting was for him. It didn't appear to show any hostility towards him, which is why he kept his distance. But at the same time, its appearance was more than enough to paralyze the man with fear. He drove off as fast as he could without looking back. Keep in mind, this was no misidentification. This is a seasoned outdoorsman. He's been around mountain lions, bobcats, bears, and all other sorts of various wildlife. He knew what he was saying was certainly nothing that he had ever seen before. The ranger was aware that whatever this was had to be something otherworldly. What he saw made him so scared he never told another living soul about it until many years later. It's also worth mentioning that this ranger does not drink, do drugs, or suffer from any mental illness at all that I'm aware of. He is a very well-spoken individual who would not say anything unless he really believed what happened to him was really the way it happened, as he described. If one person witnessed such an encounter, surely there are others since these areas are also frequented by many people a day. I'm not certain if anybody else has seen something similar to what he is talking about. But if you do, please comment below on this post. I would love to know. Normally, I've never been a believer in or a psyche of any kind of cryptid or unknown creature. However, around 1986, I was stationed aboard the USS Tortuga LST-1189 as a Navy Reserve officer. 
We had spent the day off the coast of Haiti, making sure that relief supplies were delivered to the Haitian people who needed them very much after a hurricane had demolished their country. That night, our ship was underway on its way back to Jacksonville, Florida, where we were currently based. It was dusk, and the sky had gained considerable pinkish hues, and the sun was just starting to set in the sky. Myself and two other fellow lieutenants were standing on the open bridge wings of the ship, watching Haiti fade on the horizon. As we looked over the port side of the ship, one of us three said he saw a flying creature. It was dark, so it really stood out against the pink sky. It was headed toward our ship, at least the direction from ahead of us into port. The first statement of any of us made was that it must be some kind of large bird. If you had seen the size of our propellers on the ship, you would know that a bird could get caught in it and be torn to pieces, assuming it was a large water bird that dove underneath the water. It kind of resembled a huge bat, though the closer it got, long pointed ears and a long tail. We were trying to figure out what kind of bird this was when we lost sight of it behind the mast of the ship as it rounded the front of the bridge. We lost sight of it again. Then, as our eyes followed it beyond the bow, we saw that this creature was now flying alongside of us. Our claims at first were now countered by those around us, suggesting that perhaps it wasn't a bird. But now, those gathered on deck were laughing and pointing at the creature as it flew along with us. One statement I remember was that it has got to be a bird. But this thing kept flying, and we can now see its bright red eyes glaring down onto the deck of our ship. As any of you who have ever seen a bat up close, their eyes shine with an amazing red light which you can see coming out of them even in the darkness. Now, being at night with no real background reference to compare its sides with, we were all wondering what this could possibly be. We agreed that it wasn't a goose or a condor, but maybe a pelican, although I have never seen a pelican that resembled the bat we witnessed. It flying alongside of us for about five minutes. Then, it began to glide away from the ship and across the horizon. The last we saw of it was a tiny dot on the horizon where its eyes had been glaring at us when it had glided over the water's surface. We never exactly figured out what it was, and none of us were ever believers in cryptids or strange creatures before this. I do feel that whatever we saw was some form of unknown species. I want to tell you about the time I saw an unexplained figure and it was really scary. It was the summer of 2018. We live in Brooklyn, New York. It was around 7 p.m., so there was plenty of light. My brother and I were walking home from this Mexican restaurant that we used to go to and we were cutting through an alleyway on our way home. We saw this human-like figure to our right. It was in a tree and we were both like, WTF. It was really weird. So we just kept talking and it jumped out of the tree and landed right at the base of the tree. Then it straightened up. It was about six feet tall. It was pure black. It looked more like a really tall, thin human, but it had a canine-like face. It was terrifying. And it had these curled horns, like a goat. It also had really long fingers. It was kind of hunched over, but I could just like feel it look into my soul. I honestly don't know what it was. I have for the longest time thought that it could have been a demon but it gets scarier from there. So my brother and I both see it and we lock our eyes on the ground. We don't want to make eye contact with it. So we start walking away a little bit faster and we are talking about whatever we could talk about to not even acknowledge it. So we turn the corner and right in front of us was this building that had a tin roof and we could hear it land on the top of the roof. We could hear it turning the corner of the roof with us. We looked at each other and we both just started running all the way home. I don't put a lot of merit into religious things personally, but I always thought that that could have been a demon. I took my kids on a camping trip once, but our site was surrounded by woods. After they fell asleep one night, 
I tossed and turned for a while and then decided to walk my dog to the end of the lane and sit on the bench in the children's playground. I was just enjoying the late summer air and my normally very calm lab was starting this very low growl. She kept it up despite my shushing her and kept staring into the playground. There was an old metal swing set with four swings, and all of a sudden, just one of the swings started swinging by itself. Initially, I thought wind might be stirring it, and I sort of froze just watching it pick up speed while my dog erupted into barking. I bolted back to the tent and did my best not to wake my kids, but I just could not calm down. I've never told them what happened. Sometimes I go on late night walks with my partner, like 2 or 3 a.m. It's a route that we often take during the day as well, and by this particular point we'd done the walk a few times. It's a paved road through a park, so it's not particularly hazardous. Sometimes we've heard coyotes in the distance, but that was never a big deal. I like to listen to the frogs and other night noises. Reminds me of where I grew up. But this one night we decided to go out when it was way, way too dark. Overcast, very little moon, a dark night. Part of the road is covered by trees, so it was even darker. We're walking slowly just for safety. We talk while we walk and I always figure that's good enough for most wild beasts. And if a random stone her or whoever happens to be out there, they'll also hear us coming and not get spooked. But right as we start to come out of the trees into the clearing, she catches a glimpse of movement off to the side of the road. She grabs my arm and asks what's that, and I'm like I don't think it's anything. But then I see it too. I'm trying to keep it cool, because I know that if it's an animal just being calm and speaking clearly usually will send them off, but I'm starting to pick up her fear. As I walk closer, I made some kind of comment like there's definitely something. And then I think it might be a person. And she screams it's not a person or something along those lines. I whipped out my cell phone and flipped on the light, and it was a chrome miler balloon somebody had tied to the railing just blowing in the breeze. I don't think I've ever been so scared over an inanimate object in my life. We used our flashlights for the rest of the walk home. We've never gone night walking without a clear sky again. This incident happened at approximately 3 a.m on the morning of June 7, 2012. For some reason, I can remember everything like it just happened. This was not a dream or a nightmare. I woke up to the sound of a child laughing. I rode over to see where the sound was coming from. I saw the boy running back and forth beside my bed. I felt like something had control of my body. I couldn't move. My first instinct was to yell, but when I tried, nothing would come out. At this point, I then realized how bright my room was. It wasn't like sunlight, but it was so bright my whole room was light. I looked to my window and that's when I saw the large gray alien out my window. Now what's weird is my window is on the second floor of the house so it must have been able to hold on somehow, or levitate. I don't know if it was supposed to let me see it because when we made eye contact it seemed to teleport away. The only way I can describe the teleportation is that it went from a solid being to a static kaleidoscope type image, and then vanished. At that point, I was able to move again. I remember going to the window and that's when I saw about six more of the tall alien gray types slipping back into the woods. But it was so bright and at that point, I could tell the light source was coming from directly above my house. I then remember the boy grabbing my hand and pulling me towards my bedroom door. I remember not really being able to fight back. I was in a zombie state of mind. When I reached the top of my stairs just outside my room there was a woman sitting at the top of the steps. For some reason, I didn't feel afraid anymore. She wore a pink hooded sweatshirt and gray sweatpants and she told me not to be afraid that we had met before and that the boy was ours, but he lived with them. 
From there all I remember was the three of us walking out of the house and then everything went blank. I will add that this is not my only experience with abduction. The reason why I know this really happened is that I remember telling my sister and brother-in-law this story, and they both looked at each other in shock. They told me how my brother-in-law's mother woke up randomly one night and said that outside was so bright. Brighter than the daylight were her words. It was coming from over my house, but she never went to the window because she was too scared. That was over ten years ago. I have not seen my hybrid son since. My partner and I set off for a weekend camping trip in the Rocky Mountains after work on a Friday. Late start, so we didn't get to the road we were looking to camp off of until late. It was getting dark. We found a cleared area, parked my jeep and hastily set up our two-person tent, threw in our sleeping arrangements and dog, and hopped in the tent for the night. We were playing a board game sitting cross-legged around 9 p.m. when something swiped at the back of my head through the tent wall. We panicked a bit, used remote start on the car to scare whatever it was off. I tried to convince myself and my partner that it was a falling stick. There was no wind and we were in a clearing. The next morning we came to discover that we were about 10 feet from a half-eaten deer in a mountain lion's pantry. I got pet on the head by a mountain lion. Mind you, I'm well above average height and this kitty was taller than me sitting down. Not my story, but a co-worker, we are in the natural resources field doing a lot of biological surveys, checking properties, building trails, etc. A co-worker of mine was in a remote area of a small park. She was doing some GPS monitoring of invasive species and came upon a naked older fella in a wheelchair doing yoga in the woods. She didn't see him until she was right next to him. He struck up an awkward conversation with no shame. She has no idea how he managed to get the wheelchair out there. There were no nearby trails, and the closest road was pretty far away, maybe a half mile through steep hills and thick brush. She still questions whether she hallucinated the whole thing. I've also found a mattress covered in bones and blood, which luckily tuned out to be deer bones, but still unsettling. I was out night walking with my friends in the local national forest, and all of a sudden we hear some crunching nearby. We stop and listen, whispering to each other, and all of a sudden the crunching stops and we hear some whispers as well. We have no idea what's going on and start shining the trees with our IR lights and bam we get lit up too. Thinking it's white light I take my nods off but I can't see anything. And then it clicked. It was another group of dudes doing the exact same thing. They sort of realized at the same time and we all started laughing with relief and met up to compare gear. Ended up being a cool group of guys and we all went on with our night remembering that we're not the only ones out there with that kind of tech. I can only imagine how many people we freaked out who couldn't see us, but this was the first time we ran into someone who could. When I was a very young child, like six or seven, I wandered off from my parents at a picnic in the Australian bush. The thing you need to understand about the Australian bush is that the forests are really dense and really messy, making it extremely difficult to move through, not even mentioning the fact that basically every animal you come across will kill you. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, it was really common for kids to go missing in the bush and never be found again because it was ridiculously hard to search the bush and extremely easy to be killed. Well, by some miracle, after seven hours of searching with police in the local town, I was found completely unharmed. 
But the whole ordeal was really scarring for young me, and to this day I still can get anxious when thinking about that day. The Australian bush is just something else. I watched in boredom as yet another drop of sweat ran down my forehead and landed with a splash onto my rifle. This was my first time holding a gun, and I hadn't anticipated how heavy it would be. I looked over to my colleague who, in the blistering midday sun, frantically applied sunscreen to his pale English skin. Glancing down, I scanned the forest floor below the dense jungle canopy, fixing my gaze on the large chunk of elephant meat we had placed as bait. We had been sitting up in that contraption for hours by that point, waiting. I believe it's called a tree stand, but by its size it might as well have been a small watchtower. In case you're unfamiliar, a tree stand is a small platform that hunters attach to trees in order to gain a high vantage point over their hunting ground. The tree stand we were waiting in consisted of a fairly large rectangular platform with metallic rails running around its edges. How these grunts managed to install this thing all the way up here is beyond me. Damn mosquitoes. Dr. Fernsby, my boss, blurted out under his breath as he squashed the bug under the palm of his hand. I already knew he wasn't cut out for this environment. Fernsby was a veterinarian based out of Oxford. He specialized in the treatment of exotic animals, specifically reptilian and avian species. Though I quickly came to realize that his specialization came strictly from within the comforts of a lab or a clinic, and not from the actual field. I was, at the time, a 25-year-old grad student and had been working part-time as Dr. Fernsby's research assistant for a few months before he requested I accompany him on this expedition. Even prior to meeting him for the first time back in January, I was already familiar with his work. He was a talented veterinarian and a proficient animal consultant to a number of wildlife preserves and zoos worldwide. It came to me as no surprise when I heard how adamant our employer had been that Dr. Fernsby be on board with the project. The doctor was the best at what he did. With a series of sudden and loud metallic thuds, my eyes quickly darted over to the large container fastened on the back of the flatbed truck that had arrived with us. It started shaking, violently bobbing from side to side with each thud as if something within was trying to break free. The only things that kept the crate in its place were two sets of yellow ratchet straps, which seemed to loosen ever so slightly with each bang. The fact that the container hadn't fallen off during the treacherous ride over was a miracle in itself. Then two men dressed in camo pattern tank tops and cargo pants promptly exited the vehicle and made their way toward the shaking container. They each had something long and black in their hands, but from the distance they were at, it was hard to make out details. What do you think they have in there? King Kong. I asked Dr. Fernsby, trying to make like conversation. We hadn't spoken to each other a lot these past three hours. Huh, he replied confused, cocking his head to look at me. It seemed as if I had broken him from some sort of trance. In there, the container, I said, pointing toward the truck. Oh, he said, I don't know. I looked to my side at the other man up in the tree stand with us a big game hunter from South Africa named Arno. I didn't know much about him, except that he had a reputation of frequently hunting large endangered mammals like elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and even lions on some occasions. Out for sport. From the moment I met Arno, I could tell Dr. Fernsby took a dislike to him, and so did I. Arno sat completely still, looking through the scope of his rifle, unfazed by the extreme heat and excess of insects. I wondered whose genius idea it was to pair a couple of veterinarians with a trophy hunter. Then, a loud humming, like that from an engine, gradually grew louder and louder. I figured I would soon get the answer to my question. I looked back over to the two men in tank tops beneath us. They had now climbed onto the back of the truck. They each unlocked a series of hatches on the container, 
and inserted the black object through one of the various openings. A chorus of loud crackling sounds emanated from the container, along with rapid flashes of blue light. For a moment, the thuds from within became more aggressive than ever, almost knocking one of the men over. But as the crackling continued, the container gradually calmed down. The thudding died out, and peace had once again returned to the jungle. The low hum of the approaching engine also came to a stop, and the sound of a car door opening and closing could be heard below. It had been very clear from the start that these guys weren't involved with any kind of wildlife preservation group, as they had said they were when they first reached out to us. When masked men wielding assault rifles greeted us at the runway immediately after stepping off the plane, I knew Dr. Fernsby had made a serious lapse of judgment in coming here. Though the fact remained, they hadn't hurt us nor treated us badly, not yet anyway, if anything, they were quite accommodating. These men were surprisingly well-spoken and mannered, despite their frightening appearances. The platform started shaking as someone had begun making their way up the flimsy rope ladder. I looked down below me and saw a figure rapidly ascending. Apologies for the wait. Gentlemen, the man panted as he had reached the top of the ladder. He stretched out his hand and introduced himself as Mr. Adebayo, our employer. He was a tall and handsome African man, who despite the intense heat of the jungle, wore a white three-piece designer suit. I am pleased to see my men were able to transport you here safely. I do hope you had a pleasant ride, the eccentric man said with a smile. I looked down at the deteriorated Humvee we arrived in and scoffed. Mr. Adebayo's gaze shifted toward Arno, specifically his rifle. Arno took notice. Don't worry, Carfantano, Arno said reassuringly in a thick South African accent. Confused, Mr. Adebayo raised his eyebrows. Tranquilizer, Arno added, removing a cylindrical dart filled with clear liquid from his vest and holding it up. Good, Mr. Adebayo replied. In those, he gestured toward the munitions belt tied around his shoulder. It was filled with all kinds of bullets, from low caliber to high and everything in between. Plan B, Arno said. Mr. Adebayo pointed over to me and nodded toward my rifle. And what about him? He asked. Tranquilizer as well, sir. Arno replied. Gave it to him this morning. Pleased with the answer, Mr. Adebayo stepped back and smiled. I can't stress enough how important it is that we bring it in alive, gentlemen. Unharmed, that is why you two are here. Adebayo said and pointed to Dr. Fernsby and I, if anything should go wrong, I trust your expertise within this field should come in handy, doctor. A brooding and quizzical grimace formed across Fernsby's face. And exactly what are we supposed to be bringing in here? He inquired. Lions, Bigfoot, Adebayo chuckled. Oh, I can't do it justice by describing it, Doctor. You have to see it with your own eyes. Besides, I wouldn't want to spoil all the fun. You might not dare to stay the night otherwise, Adebayo said with a smirk. Don't you think it's important that we know what we're looking for? Arno questioned with a hint of irritation in his voice. I could tell he wasn't one to play games. Oh, trust me, you will know when you see it. Adebayo once again vaguely replied. He took a step forward and continued. Livestock found killed, a village in ruins, and four people reported missing. This is not a creature from our world, I can assure you of that. I exchanged concerned looks with Dr. Fernsby. Without saying a word, I could tell that he only had one thing on his mind. This guy is crazy. Now, any more questions? Adebayo asked. Yet again, a loud metallic thud filled the air and sounded throughout the jungle, and I could hear the men in tank tops shouting at each other. What's in that cage? I asked, pointing down at the container on the truck below. Call it. Plan B. Adebayo smirked and winked at Arno before he turned around and walked toward the ladder. It will be night soon. I expect all will be revealed sooner rather than later. And with that, Mr. Adebayo climbed down the ladder, got in his jeep, 
and drove off through the dense vegetation until only the humming of his engine could be heard. And then, the two faded away. The three of us looked at each other perplexed, though we didn't say a word. Arno got back into position and resumed scanning the jungle for movement. As long as I'm still getting paid, he sighed, as time progressed. The shadows drew longer and a beautiful orange hue dyed the evening sky. Yet, there was still no sign of whatever animal we were looking for. The chunk of elephant meat we had placed out hours ago had started decomposing, and a foul stench radiated throughout the rainforest. As far as I could tell, Arno hadn't moved at all during the past couple of hours. I almost refused to believe he was human. I looked down to the two men by the truck below us. They had set up a couple of hammocks in which they had fallen asleep an hour ago. Things seemed to quiet down in the jungle as well. Fewer birds were singing now, and I hadn't heard movement from within the cage in what felt like forever. As I sat in the evening sun, Taking in the serene rainforest that surrounded me, the faint scratching sound came from directly behind me. Curious, I turned around and caught a shadowy glimpse of movement in the corner of my eye. I searched the nearby branches of the trees next to ours, but I saw nothing. Then the shadow appeared again from behind one of the branches of a tree no more than 15 meters away. Before I could get a closer look, it once again disappeared from view. Something was traversing the forest canopy at incredible speeds. Slightly alarmed, I stood up and walked to the back of the tree stand in order to get a closer look. Neither Fernsby nor Arno had cared enough to notice my commotion. The shadow moved again, leaping from one branch to another and then disappearing once again. It was even closer this time. The low evening sun made it difficult to make out any details in the gloomy jungle. Then, a high-pitched screech filled my ears as I saw the shadow leap out from behind the tree and land on a branch just a few meters away. Fernsby had definitely heard it by now, and he turned around to see what was responsible for the awful noise. The creature growled, and in the dark shadows of the rainforest I could barely make out its features. It was sitting there, perched on a thick branch, holding something with both its arms, eating something. The animal was vaguely humanoid in appearance, and covered in sleek black fur. Two bright specks of light reflected from the creature's large eyes. I inched closer to the metal rail on the edge of the platform in order to get a better look. Another shadow appeared on the tree to my right, and then another one on my left. Then another, the animals skittered across the canopy and drew closer to our tree stand. I felt a gust of hot air brush down the back of my neck, and I swiftly turned around to see a large dark face with grinning teeth staring directly at me. I'm ashamed to say the sight startled me so much that I nearly lost my balance and fell over the guard rails. Up close, there was no mistaking the identity of the creature. It was some species of monkey or ape. And up close, it was rather cute as well. Fernsby chuckled. Bonobo, he said with a smile, probably juvenile, judging by its size. I stretched my hand out to pet it. But Arno protested. For the first time since Mr. Adebayo had left us, Arno moved. He turned around and looked me dead in the eye. Don't touch it. They are a nasty and vicious sort. You're better off leaving it alone. He warned me as he rolled up his sleeve and showed off a thick line of scar tissue that ran down his forearm. You don't want to lose an arm, do ya? Though feeling that he was somewhat over-exaggerating the inherent danger, I still retracted my hand and took a step away from the innocent-looking ape. For a brief moment, the three of us all stood in the rapidly fading sunlight and stared curiously at the troop of apes. Dr. Fernsby watched in awe as the apes jumped around and played with each other. Fernsby had treated a couple of primates at the clinic back in Oxford, but seeing them thriving in their natural habitat must have given him a sense of childlike wonder he'd forgotten he had. Suddenly, one of the apes froze and tilted its head. Its large, dark eyes widened and it began uncontrollably screaming. Soon after, the others followed. They had gone crazy by the looks of it. 
Something had startled them. The primates scattered across the trees and as suddenly as they had appeared, they were now gone. At the same time, a flock of exotic birds cawed and began rapidly flapping their wings in unison, flying above the canopy away from the forest. They too seemed to be fleeing from something. A wave of dread washed over me. The air felt thicker now and the atmosphere had taken on a more sinister tone. Behind me, I heard Arno curse quietly under his breath. And then he cursed loudly. What's the matter? Dr. Fernsby asked but to no response. Arno picked up his rifle and frantically scanned the forest floor below. No, 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 he blurted out. I placed my hand on his shoulder and asked him what the problem was, but again, he paid no attention to it. Damn it, Arno, just talk to us, what's wrong? I shouted at him, greatly annoyed by this point. The meat, Arno finally said, confused, I further inquired me. What are you talking about? The elephant meat. The bait we placed. He replied. What about it? Dr. Fernsby asked worriedly. Well, bloody look at it. It's gone. Night fell swiftly in the jungle, and a thick cloak of darkness had draped itself over the clearing we had been watching. The only light visible came from the faint rays of moonlight that occasionally shone through the jet black overcast above. For the past 20 minutes Arno had been fumbling with one of the field radios he carried, trying to get into contact with the two sleeping mercenaries below us, but it was to no avail. Even if they were awake, I doubted we could get the radio working and get into contact with them. Whenever Arno tried broadcasting, only static interference could be heard coming from the other end. At one point he even changed the channels in order to get into contact with Mr. Adebayo, but the signal didn't seem to be strong enough as he received nothing but static. Maybe it's due to those clouds, Dr. Fernsby theorized, pointing up at the dark storm clouds that drifted closer by the minute. I can go down there if you'd like. Wake them up, I offered, but Arna protested, saying it wasn't worth the risk. Hey, Arno abruptly shouted, breaking the calm silence of the forest. He waved his arms up and down and shouted again. Fernsby shushed him and tried to get him to calm down. You're scaring it away, stop that. He warned Arno. Down below there was movement in the two hammocks. It worked. Shut up. Fernsby said again. You're scaring it. The animal, you're scaring it. Arno stopped once he noticed the two mercenaries were now awake and he had gotten their attention. He turned his head toward the doctor, or attracting it. He responded to Fernsby. The men in tank tops promptly rushed to their radios, but only the crackle of static could be heard. With a greatly over-exaggerated gesture, Arno pointed over to where the bait had laid. The men turned and now too noticed that it had disappeared. One of them raised his hand and gave us a thumbs up while the other walked to the back of the flatbed truck and started unlocking the hatches on the container. What are they doing? Fernsby asked Arno, who just simply replied with plan B, I presume. The large metallic door of the cage swung open and the other man walked over to assist. They each grabbed the large chain and started tugging, pulling whatever was attached to it out of the cage. Meanwhile, I noticed three large drops of water splashing down on the railing in front of me, followed by a loud rumbling, and an additional two more drops. Down below, a deep growl could be heard as the two men had dragged whatever recited in the container out into the forest clearing. Attached to the chains walked a large dark figure on all fours. Clearly the two men must have given it some form of anesthesia, otherwise the animal could easily escape from its confines. Instead, the sedated animal walked slowly and without rhythm. It looked as if it could fall over at any moment. Once the men had pulled the animal out into the middle of the clearing, they each took their chain and bolted it down into the ground on opposite sides, binding the animal in place. A ray of moonlight shone through the thick clouds above, and we could now see the creature clearly. The poor animal was a large silverback gorilla, grotesquely tied down by massive chains on the forest floor below us. 
It was being used as bait. Live bait. I could see that Dr. Fernsby was furious. He turned to Arno and profusely yelled at him. But Arno shifted the blame. He didn't know what Plan B entailed either. Though he wasn't directly responsible, I could see in his eyes that he had no remorse for the poor ape. He had probably hunted worse, done worse. The slow patter of raindrops on the triangular roof of the tree stand had started picking up its pace, and streams of water ran down its corners. The rain combined with the inky blackness of the jungle made it hard to see what was going on in the clearing. A loud wailing sound could be heard from the gorilla, and as the two men walked back to the truck, the animal let out a soft whimper. It was heartbreaking, but there was nothing I could do. Not from up here, not with these men, and not in this rain. The mercenaries proceeded to climb inside the front seats of the truck to seek shelter from the rain. Can you see anything? I asked Fernsby, who promptly replied with a firm no. The storm picked up, and seeing through the thick wall of the torrential rain proved impossible. Besides from the heavy splashing of downpour, the only sound that could be heard in the jungle was the cries from the chained up ape. Night vision goggles. Bottom compartment. Arno said and tossed a damp canvas bag over to me. Give me a pair as well. The jungle lit up in a bright green fluorescent light as I put the goggles over my head. An electronic whirring sound emanated from the device. Though the rain still made it hard to see, I was able to get a view of the whole clearing now. I could see the gorilla, sitting on the wet mud, tugging at its chains, trying to break free. It wailed through the rain. Then a familiar stench crept its way up my nostrils. The smell of bouquet, the same smell that just hours ago had polluted the fresh jungle air. I recognized it to be the scent of the decomposing elephant meat. But, that was impossible, it had been gone for quite some time. However, now it was back, and it reeked stronger than before. I swiveled my head back and forth, scanning every tree and bush that surrounded the clearing. No signs of life, and no signs of the source of the smell. A deep rumble sounded throughout the rainforest, quickly followed by a flash of lightning. With the night vision goggles, it was almost blinding. I rubbed my eyes and then put it back on. Continuing to scan beneath the canopy, ever so slightly, the tree stand trembled. At first I thought nothing of it, until it shook again, harder this time. I asked Fernsby and Arno if they had felt it too, but they brushed it off as being the workings of the wind. Satisfied with the answer, I went back to keeping watch, until the foundation of the stand was yet again hit with a powerful vibration. A faint boom sounded, followed by the tree stand once more swaying back and forth. That didn't sound like thunder. I whispered to the doctor. The wailing of the gorilla filled my ears, and I focused my gaze on the poor primate. It seemed alarmed. The gorilla desperately tugged at its chains. The goggles whirred as I zoomed in on the animal. The ape was intently looking behind itself, over its shoulder. And then it looked up toward the wall of dense green foliage. You see that? Arno asked, tapping me on my shoulder. I adjusted my goggles and looked in the direction he pointed me at. At the edge of the forest, slightly to the left behind the gorilla, the tree line swayed unnaturally fast compared to the rest of the surrounding plants. Tall palm trees and large bushes got pushed from side to side and the dense greenery made loud cracking sounds as if a thousand twigs had snapped at once. Something big was moving through the underbrush. Jesus, what is that? I asked Arno, to no response, who quietly chambered around into his rifle and motioned for me to do the same. Even with the deafening splattering of rain, I pulled the boat on my rifle back as quietly and slowly as I could. Having noticed all the commotion, Dr. Fernsby inquired as to what was going on, but he was quickly shushed by the concentrated hunter. Another deep rumble sounded, and the tree stand once again shook violently, and then another, followed by yet another. Whatever it was was coming closer. With each vibration, large ripples formed on the puddles of mud down below, and the distressed gorilla, 
fueled by adrenaline, hopelessly pulled at its chains. What is going on? Please just talk to me, Dr. Fernsby demanded in a frustrated manner. For the last time, be quiet. Arno hissed at the doctor. The sound of a large branch snapping in half shot past the noise of the heavy downpour, and through the thick rainfall I could make out a large shadow slowly emerging from the vegetation, about seven meters above the gorilla. I zoomed in with my goggles to get a closer look at the shape. I think Arno did too, as I heard his goggles emit a low whir. There, high above in the tree line at the edge of the forest, right behind where the gorilla sat, an enormous scaly snout had emerged from the leaves. Attached to the long snout were a set of large, sharp serrated teeth. It almost resembled the snout of a crocodile, except this was way more rounded and broad in its design. The rest of the head was still concealed behind the dense foliage, making it impossible to get a better look at the rest of the creature. In the bright green of the night vision goggles, I could see vents of steam shoot out of the beast's nostrils as it exhaled. You ought to see this, doctor, I said, taking off my night vision goggles and passing them over to Fernsby. He put them on and searched around in the darkness for a while, until he abruptly stopped and gasped. Even without the goggles, I could still make out the dark shape of the creature's snout poking out of the tree line just over a hundred meters away. Remarkable, Fernsby proclaimed, trying to zoom in with his goggles. A new species of megafauna, never before observed by the eyes of science. If we're lucky, we might get to name it. I jokingly said to him, trying to hide the nervous undertones in my voice. I could tell the doctor was awestruck but I didn't quite share the same feeling. Sure, the creature didn't look like a threat from way over there, but that head was suspended high off the ground, maybe high enough that it could reach the tree stand if it came over here. No, I didn't feel a sense of joy at this new discovery. I felt horror. Faster than the blink of an eye, the large beast came crashing down through the foliage and wrapped its twisted jaws around the torso of the poor gorilla. I witnessed in horror as I saw the ape being lifted high up in the air by the monster. The gorilla's chain snapped as the large beast shook its prey from side to side. It then put the great ape down on the ground and began tearing off large chunks of its flesh. Into the dark I thankfully couldn't make out all the gory details. I looked over to Arno who had raised his rifle in preparation of shooting the large beast. However, I could see that he too was terrified. Below I could hear the nauseating sounds of flesh ripping and bones cracking. Just from its dark silhouette, I could tell the beast was massive. It stood maybe six or seven meters tall, or around twenty feet for you Americans. It seemed to be mainly bipedal, although it alternated between using its massive forelimbs for support. The creature had a long and thick tail covered in scales which it used for balancing itself. When it was done eating, it lifted its enormous head and sniffed in the air. Steam oozed out of its nostrils with each sniff. In the faint moonlight I could see the reflective glistening of blood around its mouth. Had it caught onto our scent, it let out a deep snarl and took a few steps toward us. The ground shook each time one of the animal's powerful hind legs slammed into the ground. Given the goggles, Arna whispered to Fernsby, he needs them to see what he's shooting. Fernsby handed over the goggles and once again I quickly put them back on. In shades of nauseating green I could see the monstrosity in way more detail now. A thick plumage of what looked like feathers covered its rigid back. My gaze shifted to the head of the creature. It had large reptilian eyes, like that of a snake, with small cartilaginous ridges rising above each eye socket, probably to shade them from sunlight during the day. Jesus Christ, what does a Debeo even want with a freak of nature like that? Fernsby whispered, Power, I'm guessing. Arno replied, He is a warlord after all. There is no way he could ever get control over that thing. I shot in, agreed. Then, to everyone's surprise, the headlight beams of the flatbed truck suddenly turned on and illuminated the right side of the animal. 
The large animal cocked its head and walked over to the vehicle in which the two mercenaries sat. No, 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 turn it off, turn it off. I heard Arno whisper under his breath, readying his rifle. Down below I could hear frantic shouting in a language I didn't understand. The beast lowered its head right besides the front door of the cabin and used one of its big eyes to peer in through the window. The shouting abruptly came to an end. The beast let out an ear-piercing roar, and in one fluid motion it swung its head and sank its sharp teeth into the metal exterior of the truck. It bit down and tore off the roof of the truck cabin. Arno and I raised our rifles and shot at the creature. It didn't even flinch. With my night vision goggles I could see the two men cowering in their seats. One of them unbuckled his seatbelt and exited the truck on the opposite side of the creature. The remaining man fumbled with his buckle, but couldn't get free. The creature cocked its head curiously to look at the trapped mercenary. I reloaded my rifle and took another shot at the beast. It had no effect. The creature came crashing down on the truck. The mercenary screamed as the animal ripped him from his seat and lifted him into the air. The screams came to a sudden stop as the beast raised back its head and swallowed the man whole. A loud shouting could be heard coming from the left side of the large animal. The other man stood out in the middle of the forest clearing. Mokalimbim, Mokalimbim, he shouted as he raised an assault rifle and took aim. Before the man could pull the trigger, the monster grabbed him with one of its forearms and raised him high over the ground. Arnold took another shot. A loud crackle sounded, and a bright flash appeared around the man. The animal loosened its grip and the mercenary fell face down into the wet mud. He had used his stun baton to get free. The man crawled along the wet forest floor in an attempt to escape. The large reptile caught up to him and pressed one of its legs down onto the man's back, crushing him and leaving a massive three-toed footprint of blood and gore. It bent down to feast on what remained of the poor fellow. In unison, we both took yet another shot at the creature. This time it flinched and snapped its head toward the location of the tree stand. It bellowed in agony and began making its way to where we sat perched. Just as I was about to take another shot, my rifle jammed. I tilted it to the side to see that an empty cartridge had gotten itself stuck in between the chamber and the bolt slightly poking out. In a panic I looked over to Arno, hoping he would know how to fix it. Pull the bolt back, damn it. He shouted. I did as he said, but it wouldn't nudge. I felt the ground tremble beneath me as the creature stood only a few meters away. In a panic I dropped my rifle just as the powerful jaws of the animal bit down onto the platform. It shook its head from side to side in an attempt to detach the tree stand. I fell backwards on the floor, landing on my side. My night vision goggles slipped off my head and slid down off the platform, disappearing into the dark shrubbery below. The beast let go off the platform and instead walked to the side of the stand. It circled us for a while, snarling and growling while it was trying to figure out how to get to us. Then it stopped to our right. Somehow it had identified the support cables that held the tree stand in its place. It hissed and tore at them with its powerful claws, until finally the sound of a taut metal cable going limp filled my ears with dread. Hold on to something. Dr. Fernsby shouted at the top of his lungs just as the tree stand lost its balance and tipped over. I grabbed the metal railing and braced for impact, but it never came. We never hit the ground. The Stan Hun suspended at a 60-degree angle from one of the remaining support cables. Bags, boxes, and crates slid down the wet floor past me and fell down into the jungle below. The creature roared beneath me. It sounded like a chorus of rusty chairs being dragged across a concrete floor. I looked around to see that Dr. Fernsby held on to dear life by one of the rails on the opposite side of the platform but there was no sign of Arno the hunter. Below I could see the open jaws of the animal snapping after my legs. I was just out of reach. Then, to my horror, the railing bent and bent until it finally snapped, sending me falling for what felt like an eternity. 
I hit the wet mud of the forest floor with a soft thud and saw that my colleague also lay beside me, unmoving and covered in dirt. Still no sign of Arno. I quickly rose to my feet and rushed over to help Fernsby when a large shadow cast itself on the ground beneath, ominously looming over us. I brushed mud and water out of my eyes to see the animal standing a short distance away, looking down at us. It cocked its head and I could see its raw muscles tensing in anticipation of leaping forwards. Then, someone's loud shouting filled the air. Arno stood in the middle of the clearing, holding his rifle. He waved one of his arms and continued shouting. He had managed to capture the creature's attention, and the large beast turned toward him. My ears rang as he shot at the creature. He wasn't using the tranquilizer darts anymore. The beast let out an agonizing roar and began running in his direction. Seeing my opportunity, I helped Fernsby get to his feet and we made a run for the Humby Park right beside the now ravaged flatbed truck. Lucky for us, the keys were still in the ignition. I slammed my foot down at the gas pedal and the tires began spinning, slinging mud in every direction before the vehicle finally started moving forward. Through the windshield I could see the massive beast standing in the middle of clearing, partially illuminated by the headlights of the truck. In the creature's mouth, Arno hung from his left arm, writhing in pain. The thick stream of blood ran down the arm and covered the hunter's body in a sickly shade of crimson red. The animal bit down and Arno fell to the ground. He clutched at his severed arm and cried out in pain. The animal's head then pummeled down, and the screaming finally stopped. I turned the car around and drove onto the dilapidated dirt road we had arrived on. Palm trees and jungle vines passed by as I floored the gas pedal. Behind, I could feel the ground trembling, and in the rear view mirror I could see the beast giving chase. It took long and powerful strides, swiftly and elegantly running on its hind legs. It reminded me of the way a large terrestrial bird would run, like an ostrich or an emu. The large carnivore had started gaining on us, quickly covering great distances with each step it took. And then it stopped. It just stood there in the middle of the road. Had it suddenly decided to give up. Just like that. In the rear view mirror, the creature gradually began shrinking. It let out a final bellowing roar before it disappeared into the thick jungle by the side of the road. The rubber windshield wipers desperately wiped away the pattering rain on the glass of the Humvee as I continued to speed down the muddy thoroughfare. As we rounded a sharp turn, my eyes were drawn to the dismantled jeep that laid upside down in a ditch on the side of the road. Its tires were ripped off, the tail lights blinked a bright red, and large claw marks ran along its side. Since we were moving so fast, I didn't get the chance to properly investigate the scene. But as I sped past, I could have sworn I saw a white blazer covered in specks of crimson hanging from a branch on a nearby tree. It took us no more than two days to leave the country and fly back to England. We didn't bother trying to report our experience to the local authorities back in Congo. We didn't expect they would believe us anyway, and we definitely didn't want to get into any trouble. We packed our bags and left with the first plane available. Dr. Fernsby is still a little shaken up after the traumatic incident, but he is mostly fine. This all happened a few years ago, but I felt it was important we finally share what happened to us that fateful day in the humid jungles of the Congo Basin. As of late, I've seen news articles online detailing discoveries of ravaged towns in the Congolese countryside. The few remaining survivors blame the disaster on an entity they call Mokul Mbem. When I first read it, I knew I had heard the name from somewhere before, and then chills shivered down my spine as I recalled the last words of the brave mercenary. In his final moments, he had called the beast Mokul Mbem as well. I've done some research and have come to find Mokul Mbem describing a large quadrupedal animal, or water spirit that resides in lakes and rivers. Mokul Mbem is described as an herbivorous reptile possessing a long neck, like that of a sauropod dinosaur. 
Some people believe Mokalimbamba is living proof that Mesozoic era dinosaurs survived into the modern world, previously thought to have gone extinct around 65 million years ago. However, the description of Mokalimbem does not match the beast I encountered that night many years ago. The creature I encountered certainly didn't have an abnormally long neck, and it for sure wasn't herbivorous. This begs the question, are there more of them out there? Different species? Is there an undiscovered ecosystem thriving in the deep recesses of the Congo Basin, waiting to be discovered? According to the Congolese government, Around 80% of the jungle around the northeastern part of the country remains uncharted. Who knows what mysteries are left to unfold? What wonders, secrets, and horrors are left to be observed under the watchful eyes of scientists? I've made attempts to contact Dr. Fernsby, but I have as of this moment not received any response. I'm using my university to try and raise funding for this next expedition, and so far the council seems to be on board with the idea. Of course, I haven't told them everything, not yet anyway. Ever since that night, I have had an obsessive compulsion to return to the jungle. The lull of adventure and discovery is calling upon me. I have to go back. I have to know if something has survived. In the picturesque countryside west of Eugene, nestled near the quaint town of Veneta, my wife and I experienced an extraordinary encounter on a warm summer day in 1985. Riding our trusty Vespa scooter, we reveled in the wind whistling past us as we coasted downhill, our laughter carried away by the breeze. As we descended, the vibrant green of the Oregon landscape enveloped us in a sense of serenity. The sun filtered through the leaves, casting dappled shadows on the road ahead. Our carefree spirits matched the carefree speed of our scooter. With the wind tousling our hair, it felt as if we were in our own little world, blissfully unaware of what lay just beyond the curve. With each twist and turn, we ventured closer to an unexpected spectacle that awaited us. As we rounded a bend, our eyes widened in disbelief. There, in a shallow ditch, lay a creature that defied all explanation, a massive Bigfoot, sound asleep. The creature's sandy brown fur was tinged with hints of reddish hues, its immense form cocooned in repose. The scooter's purr transformed into a soft hum as we glided closer, our fascination and trepidation mingling in our gazes. The creature, normally so elusive and rumored, lay there in all its glory, its chest rising and falling with each breath. Its features were remarkably detailed, from the dark pools of its closed eyes to the impressive muscles that defined its arms and legs. And then, as if sensing our presence or perhaps the vibration of our approach, the Bigfoot stirred. Slowly, its eyes opened and we found ourselves locked in a gaze that transcended the boundaries of our worldviews. The creature's gaze held a mixture of curiosity, surprise, and perhaps a touch of amusement. It was a moment suspended in time, the boundary between reality and fantasy blurring into an indistinguishable realm. As our Vespa coasted past the dozing giant, my wife and I continued to look back, our expressions a fusion of awe and disbelief. The creature watched us, its gaze lingering on our retreating figures, as if acknowledging our shared connection in that fleeting instant. The rest of the ride back to our home was a whirlwind of emotions and hushed conversations. We grappled with the enormity of what we had just witnessed, struggling to reconcile our encounter with the conventional reality we knew. Who would believe our story? Did we even believe it ourselves? In the years that followed, my wife and I found ourselves revisiting the day in our minds over and over again. We became avid researchers, delving into the mysteries of Bigfoot sightings and accounts. The memory of that summer day fueled our curiosity and guided us on a path of exploration we never could have predicted. We shared our tale with a select few, who listened with varying degrees of skepticism. 
Some dismissed it as a fanciful fabrication born from the excitement of a downhill ride, while others entertained the possibility that we had indeed crossed paths with a creature that defied explanation. Now older but still filled with the same sense of wonder, my wife and I continued to revisit the spot where we had encountered the slumbering giant. We never saw the creature again, but the memory of its gaze remains imprinted on our souls, a reminder that the world is far more mysterious and magical than we had ever imagined. Our Vesper rides have taken on a new significance, each journey a testament to the inexplicable moments that can alter the course of one's life. And as we ride together through the hills west of Eugene, near Veneta, we know that even in the most ordinary of landscapes, extraordinary wonders can be found, if only one dares to believe in the possibility. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.